Well, would you look at that? We scored four goals at Villa Park again. That makes it a cool, dirty dozen down at the Villa on this, the one-year anniversary of him actually taking over in the dugout. We're closing in on Tony Barton's 1983 record of 13 straight wins at Villa Park. Are we about to see a 40-year all-time record fall? I realize there is a tricky trip to the city ground before that, which we'll talk about later. But more important for me than records or even the three points is this game beautifully encapsulated the evolution or emery lution of this club because that's precisely the type of opponent and game that might have flummoxed us in the past. So let's get into it. Aston Villa 3, Luton Town 1. Before we get to the match itself, a lot of news and tidbits to share, including the passing of club icon Charlie Aitken, the Scottish left back, who astonishingly played 660 games for Aston Villa, which included multiple relegations and promotions again. I've never seen him play, not live or on any kind of footage, but... 660 games is an eye-popping amount that truly personifies the word servant to a club. You would have to play 17 and a third season straight with no injuries to replicate that amount. And I completely forgot, he actually moved to North America in 1976 and 77. He played in this city of mine with Pele and Beckenbauer as a member of that very famous New York Cosmos team. I'm sure the club is going to recognize an all-time legend when the Fulham game comes around. Jaden Philogene Bidace's goal for Hull against Preston, the only one, drew a lot of comparisons with Jacob Ramsey and even Jack Grealish as he broke down the left and slotted home into the bottom corner. And of course, that led to a lot of howls of why did we let this guy go? I wanted him to stay because he's had such an unusual career path and he does have signs of the complete package. But at this critical moment of his career, where, frankly, it's still a high-risk time in any player's career, that age window, he needed to play. And he was not going to grow or evolve getting garbage minutes behind Nicolo Zaniolo or Jacob Ramsey. So in essence, the club in many ways not only fulfilled its own self-interests, but they actually helped fulfill his. And now he is playing every week. He's being counted on and he is delivering. That's a win-win for everybody and we still have the buyback clause. I'm gutted for Louis Berry, who just tore his hamstring while being in prolific form for Stockport County. Nine goals, two assists in just 15 appearances. And he's in this critical show-me stage of his career. And he's showing everybody that he is a man playing in a men's league. Now, a 20-year-old will likely recover faster and better than, say, a 30-year-old with the same injury, but still hamstrings are finicky. And the maximum recovery time is hopefully, for him, around three months. On to Luton Town, and I did say on this very show last time out that I had concerns about an opponent like this in a game that comes so quickly on the heels of the visit to Alkmaar. But my fears were completely allayed when I saw that John Brooks was the man assigned to referee this game. Aston Villa has not lost a game when John Brooks was refereeing it. That's 10 games now, nine wins and one draw. Can we please have him for the Spurs game? Did you know that halftime of the Luton game represented the quarter mark of this current Premier League season? And I found this astonishing. Through these first 10 games, we've scored 26 goals. That is exactly half of our entire total from last year of 52. You heard that correctly. We are halfway to last year's total of 52, but in a quarter of the games, 
That is dramatic. I can now officially welcome you to the Holy Trinity show named in honor of the glorious and ornate original Trinity Road grandstand in front of which Charlie Aitken would have probably played about 320 times, but Trinity also means three. I like to explore the three key issues or moments that defined Aston Villa three, Luton Town one. And we'll begin with the key numbers. Interceptions was my featured stat. And our numbers were really quite good, despite Luton's game plan of bunkering. Five big chances created in total, and five big chances missed. The first half, Zaniolo volley, Watkins denied with a great save, and then both Bailey and McGinn had glorious chances in the second. Luton's approach was clear, concise. I think it was effective for the most part until that second goal. Block the channels, intercept the ball, hopefully hit on the counter. But once Villa got to three, it was game over. Wonderful issue. The reinvention of Leon Bailey. Do you know, even a few weeks ago, my chat groups were filled with Bailey dread. And this should be a lesson to all of us football fans that form is temporary, class is permanent. And he was coming off arguably his best ever game in a Villa jersey in Holland. He didn't even start this game, but you could almost tell right away that he was just connected and dialed in. I mean, his contribution to the eventual game-winning goal where he leaps up in the air to get on the end of the Luca Dean cross and then in midair guides the ball into the perfect area of the box for his former Leverkusen teammate to latch onto. It was an absolute thing of beauty. And I have a major soft spot for Bailey. First of all, he's Jamaican, and I've never met a Jamaican person that I didn't adore. But his story is truly incredible. I mean, you want to talk about overcoming adversity? And yes, he is cute and cuddly. But don't let those looks fool you, because of late, his form as both a provider of goals and a finisher have been deadly. Big issue. It's time for Nicolo Zaniolo to score now. And I know this isn't a big deal, but I 100% believe this was entirely a Monchi recruit simply based on their past relationship at Roma. And I do think Zaniolo as a loanee represents less risk than Jaden Philogene Bidets, partially because of his age, partially because he was a key contributor to Roma's European success, which could come in handy for us down the road. And he has several senior international caps under his belt, which is something that both Monchi and Emery seem to be looking for in their recruits. Also a big guy, left-footed, tactically versatile. But man, he had a couple of great chances to bury one in the first half. None better than the one set up on a platter by Ollie Watkins, which he volleys wide. And the problem with this drought, the longer it goes on, the less confidence he may have in himself, not to mention the confidence his teammates have in him to set him up for chances like that. Plus, you've got, as I just mentioned, a razor-sharp Leon Bailey sitting on the sidelines, not getting into the starting 11. And the longer this goes, the harder it's going to be to justify for the gentleman that selects the starting 11. The cold, hard truth of the matter is that the Italian is merely keeping the seat warm for Jacob Ramsey. Full stop. Ramsey is one of our best players and probably one of the highest potential players we've had in a long, long time. And the fact we're doing so well without him should be hugely encouraging. And this is a no-risk loan for Villa in that respect. Yes, he's only had a couple of months under Unai Emery, but if the boss gets him firing, sort of like the aforementioned Leon Bailey, then we will very likely see less of this... And if he scores and contributes to goals, well, that is a wonderful bonus to have. If not, it's just a loan. We all move on. Big moment when the clean sheet was shot. I found it extremely revealing hearing the manager's reaction to conceding a goal. I mean, everything you need to know about Unai Emery and his demanding mantra was beautifully personified by the level of disappointment he had over allowing the clean sheet to slip in this game, especially in the manner that it occurred, which was, quite frankly, a little bit comical. Now, I've always maintained that if you have to have some kind of affliction, and I do have a little bit of it myself, then obsessive compulsive disorder is not a bad one. Just ask David Beckham. You'll see. Watch the series. Seriously. 
But what OCD is really about is control. And the obsession usually surrounds details. Now, both are world's best goalkeeper award winner, Emmy Martinez, and thankfully he didn't pelvic thrust this trophy. And Esri Konza, of course, would take enormous pride in their clean sheets. So when this calamity happened, I'm sure both of them realized, apart from a little bit of embarrassment, there was probably going to be a forensic audit into how something like this could happen at Bodymore Heath, which is a wonderful thing because growth occurs often through error. And the more errors you make now, the less you hopefully make down the road in really, really big games. I should point out, however, the last time Emmy Martinez scored a late own goal at Villa Park was the last time we lost at Villa Park. Big issue, neither Luca Dean nor Douglas Louise were booked and both are on a yellow card warning. Louise came very close in the 37th minute. But for two players who have been asked to contribute a lot of football this past week, they maintained a very high level of discipline and they didn't commit any of the last gasp type desperation tackles that are usually hallmarks of tired footballers. Now, it's going to be hard for them to avoid a one-game ban at some point in the next few weeks, but if they are able to be well-behaved for the next nine Premier League games, they will receive a suspension amnesty. Big moment number three, set piece success. I found it somewhat ironic because Luton Town's modus operandi under Rob Edwards, who, by the way, is a former villain, he started his career at Villa Park, it would have been to come to our manor, sit in a mid to low block, deny the space in the channels, and ideally hit on a counterattack or from their own dead ball situations. And yet it was Aston Villa who opened the scoring from another zany, wacky Austin McPhee scheme. And I had my questions and reservations about McPhee this time last year because we simply were not having enough success from those kinds of routines. But now... You know, one of the things that makes Aston Villa so much fun to watch is precisely the Scotsman's creative and innovative dead ball designs. Musa, the decoy dummy distraction Diaby, just freezes the defenders a little bit as the ball flies past him onto super scoring John McGinn, who has enough time to improvise, shift from his left to his right, and slot home. It's amazing what confidence can do and how great is it to have John McGinn scoring again and be that kind of an option for us. But the entire play rests on Douglas Louise's ability to be accurate and play the perfect pinged ball in, and he has to be looking at both Diaby and McGinn when he's playing it. And we all know what happens when you score first, especially at home. Big moment number two... Diaby Dynamite. At 1-0 down, Luton Town is still 100% in the game. But at 2-0 down, they could no longer afford just to sit off and allow Villa to have the ball. And when you do that at Villa Park now, you are risking the dam bursting open and devastating flooding to follow. So when Luca Dean picked out with an inch-perfect ball to the head of Leon Bailey, who beautifully guided it right towards the penalty spot, the only thing missing was somebody to latch on and finish it. I'm going to talk about Musa Diaby in more specific detail shortly, but here's another reason why we paid a record fee to bring this guy in. It's one thing to anticipate an opportunity to sniff out that area where the ball is going to be. It's quite another to finish a chance like that and the technique he uses. I could only describe it as a snap half volley and he gets all of it and puts it in a place where the goalkeeper has no chance from that range, but also it is so aesthetically beautiful to watch as fans, the power of it. And he's only a little slight guy. I mean, he's adorable, isn't he? And yet he packs quite a punch and he needed that goal. It'd been a while since he'd scored and he'd never scored at Villa Park. 
That goal changed the entire complexion of the game. Not only does Paul Hansaker of 24-7 Services sponsor this show, which, by the way, has led to some fantastic leads and business for which I am eternally grateful, because that's the whole point. The Villa family is a huge family. Let's support one another. But Paul also sponsors... A local football team, formerly Sutton Selects FC, now 24-7 FC. And funny enough, Paul is also the manager of that team, and he's already more qualified than Wayne Rooney, which isn't really saying much. I saw the guys work at DC United at MLS and some of the people on his staff. This is not going to end well. Look at the upcoming fixtures. Anyway, they were 4-1 winners over the weekend, and like the company... The team shows up on time, works extremely hard, has some creative flair, but spends most of their time fixing leaks. So if you want to arrange for a quote or a friendly, here are the numbers, which you'll always find in the video description. And the number one big issue or moment that defined Villa 3, Luton Town 1, recruitment rewards. I see recruitment as an art as much as anything, and it's extremely difficult to get right 100% of the time. And the first thing you need is the visionary, the head of the technical side of the game. And thank goodness we have one of the best in the world because that person needs to identify the specific characteristics of the player that he wants for his system, but that also complements the team that he currently has. Then comes some statistical data and analysis to vet those players. And lastly, you obviously need the financial resources to pull it off. And in Pau Torres and Musa Diaby, we have solved so many problems all at once. I mean, the Villa of old sometimes had a hard time getting around or through a low or mid block. And at sometimes they had a difficult time with the high press. Well, we've got players now that can deal with both of those types of situations. And in Diaby, we've also got another very pacey player to add to a team that's already pretty quick. I've said it often on this show that I think it's better to spend more money on fewer and very strategically targeted players than the bulk buy scenario where you're bringing in bodies hoping that one of them will turn out to be class. And in the case of Musa Diaby and Pau Torres, we have clearly upgraded not just the squad, but our starting 11. And that's no disrespect to Emi Buendia or Tyrone Mings because it's their positions that arguably those two players are filling. And isn't it interesting that those two have been out since the start of the season? Has that in some way helped Torres and Diaby settle faster because they have adapted shockingly fast to the Premier League. So we've clearly upgraded two of 10 of our outfield starting 11 players. That means we can legitimately say we've improved the squad by at least 20%, a squad that finished seventh last year. In the end, Musa Diaby had a hand in all three goals. I talked about his role from the set piece. He smashes home the second one and he does everything but score the third goal that he didn't even get credit for. But it's what he does the other 99% of the time during a game that doesn't get talked about enough. In fact, I'm really happy to have heard Owen Hargreaves after the West Ham game, a pundit who I respect, by the way, partially because he's Canadian, but he said after the West Ham game that Musa Diaby was by far the best player on the park. And this is a game where Douglas Louise had a really good outing and two goals. And what Hargreaves was referring to was all the stuff that oftentimes we don't get to see because it's outside of the confines of your television screen. Of course, those guys get to see the Opta statistical view, the big, wide analysis view of the whole field. And Hargreaves, seeing the game through the eyes of a central midfielder, knows precisely the kind of player that he would hate to have to play against. Luton Town represents the type of team that we've actually struggled with quite a bit over our recent history because they play in a low to mid block and they don't engage in a high press. They're asking you to solve the problems. The three ways to counter that type of a team is to either go over, around, 
or through them. And with just these two signings, we've addressed all three options. Musa Diaby's talent is that he makes these very clever five to 10 yard bursts that drags players out of passing channels. 90% of the time, he's not even going to get a pass. So that's a very selfless, but intelligent role for him. And you know, Unai Emery had very little exposure to Musa Diaby at PSG, and he was just a young guy at the time. But something in what he saw in that player must have told him that he was built precisely for that type of role, which is different from what he was asked to play at Leverkusen. So getting back to Unai Emery's ability to assess talent, which is equal parts intuition with his experience and then just his gift, his essence, which we're so lucky to have. Clearly, Diaby and Torres were 100% his signings, his recruits, because Monchi hadn't even arrived on the scene yet. Yeah, they might have tapped him up for some scouting or statistical due diligence, but these were the guys that Emery identified because of their attributes and that we needed for this team. And of course, Pau Torres was a no-brainer, low-risk signing because Emery was coaching him. There's nothing about Pau Torres that Emery doesn't know about right down to his favorite TV show. But now, with Monchi and his team and his network, Emery will have the ability to look at several options at different price points with the attributes that he's asked for. And with Pau, we now have the ability to play all those types of passes over, around, or through to break all those lines of confrontation. And none of that would really matter if he was a poor defender. But when I watched the game on Sunday again, it's incredible how much preventative work he does, the anticipatory work that he does to prevent those desperation defensive actions. Like, for example, Tyrone Mings is a fantastic desperation defensive action type player. Blocks, clearances, aerial duels, tackles. But are those happening, those situations, because he's not preventing those actions in the first place? Pau Torres also had statistically an incredible game, 95% passing accuracy in that match. That's 92 out of 97 passes. Six of those were considered long balls, 20 yards or more, and he completed half of those, three of six. It only takes one, though, to unlock a team, and he also played eight balls into the attacking third. This is why I am buzzing not just for the present, but for the future. We have a technical team that can recruit coherently and intelligently and fill either a void in the squad or upgrade certain positions in the squad and ideally not overpay. And we are now equipped to take on all comers and adapt to any style that the opponent throws at us because our coach is getting the very most out of all the players he inherited. Like, look at Bubakar Kamara, who has grown in leaps and bounds. He's a long ball threat now. He played nine into the attacking third, and he was three for three on his attacking long balls. Even Ezri Konza has developed a long ball threat, six into the front third. McGinn, Louise, nine balls played into the attacking third. Then you have Ollie Watkins. We've talked enough about him and our two fullbacks who look like completely different players from a year ago. And we don't even have Moreno and Ramsey, two players who have been afforded the time to recover after injury setbacks because our team is humming right now. I certainly hope you don't get bored of me recapping the categories that I've been following over the last few seasons because speaking of OCD, I find it immensely satisfying to watch these numbers improve every week, especially the record at Villa Park. But the Watkins and Diaby combo improved to eight goals combined. That had to be a set-piece goal. I know it wasn't directly from a dead ball situation, but the set-piece led to the goal. We're nine for nine against the bottom six. We've scored first six times this season and our first and second half plus minus both improved again by a goal. The only thing missing was the one Emmy Martinez and I know Esri Konza and Unai Emery really wanted a clean sheet. Next up, we rekindle some late 70s, early 80s European glory vibes with a visit to Nottingham in the city ground 
to battle forest. And I hate to go to the cliche cupboard and pull one out of the very top drawer, but there are no easy fixtures in the Premier League. And no matter what table position you occupy, it seems like this year especially, the home team just has an advantage. Now, Forrest has struggled this year. Only two wins on the season, one of those at home, and that was against Sheffield United. They haven't won since September 2nd at Stamford Bridge when Anthony Elanga scored on a breakaway counterattack. Now, the amount of spending, at least if you believe the numbers that you read, has been a bit of a mystery to me, how they've been able to pour so much money into that squad and add so many players. It reminded me a little bit of the Suso era after we were promoted, where we seemed to go for quantity and options for Dean Smith rather than having a clear and coherent identity in mind. But just looking at Forrest, there's no doubt in my mind they can put out a good squad and they can have a very decent spine that should survive the Premier League, given what's behind them. And last year, they were excellent at the city ground. Nine wins, including that late season one against Arsenal. But still, I've seen a lot of people say, well, we should be winning this game. And I can assure you that Unai Emery will respect Nottingham Forest fiercely and maybe even instill a sense of paranoia into his group to be desperate to not drop the level and take this game as seriously as they've taken all the other ones so far this year. And just like that... It's November, with five very tasty fixtures in store this month, including two crucial Europa Conference League home games at Villa Park, which will probably decide the fate of Group E. And then there is this monumental clash looming. Ange Ball! November 26th, the one thing I can guarantee you about that game... The Villa Parlor Christmas tree will be set up right over there and ready to go. Until the Forest game, stay well, stay refreshed. And as always, up the mighty Villa! Villa!